Good morning, everybody. You getting me, Andy? Okay, good. Everyone can come in from the outside and take your seats. Well, welcome to Eaglevale Anglican Church this morning. Uh, this morning after the service, we have our AGM. Uh, and today is also a special day in the church calendar. Does anyone know what day it is? Sorry? Palm Sunday. And on Palm Sunday, we celebrate Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem when people got palm leaves and put them down in front of the cult, the, the donkey cult, and called out, Hosanna, praise to the king. Unfortunately, they were... They were expecting a military king and uh, a week later they were crucifying him. But Palm Sunday. And uh, later on today in the sermon, um, Jeff is going to be speaking about the Gethsemane guarantee. So we'll find out what that actually means when he preaches. So we got a special dispensation from the health minister to sing without masks this morning. The Archbishop lobbied that uh, being a special day and only one day before the restrictions ease, that uh, we should be able to sing without the restrictions of masks, masks. So we are going to do that with all creatures of our God and King. Please stand.
take a seat. The Bible tells us not to hide our sins from God, our Heavenly Father, but to confess them with a repentant and obedient heart so that we might be forgiven through his boundless goodness and mercy. We ought, we ought to admit our sins to God at all times, and especially when we come together like this, to give thanks for the benefits we've received from him, to offer the praise that is due to him, to hear his holy word, and to ask him to supply whatever we need. So, let us approach the throne of our gracious God with a true heart of full assurance of faith and pray this confession together. Merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the desires of our own hearts and have broken your holy laws. We have left undone what we ought to have done and we've done what we ought not to have done. Yet, good Lord, have mercy on us. Restore those who are repentant according to the promises declared to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant, merciful Father, for his sake, that from now on we may live godly and obedient lives to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God desires that no one should perish, but that all should turn to him and live. We confess our sins in response to his call, and God pardons those who humbly repent and truly believe the gospel. Therefore, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to be hearing from God's word and the children will be going out soon. So to prepare ourselves, let's pray this prayer together. Together. Thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us, showing us the way of salvation through faith in your Son. Teach us through your word and equip us for every good work for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. And uh, the first Bible reading is Psalm 22, verses 1 to 11. And the second will be Matthew 26, 36 to 46. And Rhonda is going to read those for us. Terrible. Got to be helped up. <laughs> Our first reading this morning is from um, Psalm 22. I'll be reading verses 1 to 11. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? so far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insight, shaking, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. For my from my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no help. The second reading is from Matthew uh, 26. I'm reading 36 to 46. Gethsemane. Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him 
and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back again, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of, of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thank you, Rhonda, for reading for us. We're going to respond to the hearing of God's word by standing and declaring what we believe together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. What do we believe? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the cross, he descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is now seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Apostolic Church, the fellowship of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life eternal. Amen. Please be seated. I'm going to invite Jeff up to talk to us about the Gethsemane Guarantee. Thanks, Stuart. Good morning, everybody. It's exciting, isn't it? No masks to sing why or sing through. Thanks, Stuart. So uh, things are finally becoming released, and I think that's a fresh a refreshment to the soul, isn't it? Isn't it? It's a refreshment to the soul to be able to sing without uh, constraint, although uh, Beth tells me it's not for her standing next to me. Uh, nevertheless, I hope that God's words too bring you some refreshment this morning. But I give you, I'll give you a warning. These are hard words. They're not, um, they're not words of comfort. They're words of challenge that I uh, guess Seventy brings us. So let's bow our heads and we'll, we'll uh, pray, that, pray that Jesus. Almighty Lord, we want to humbly come before you because we know you've done things that we don't even consider uh, doing ourselves, Lord. Things that are harder and, and, uh, and more difficult than human imagination could, could uh, conjure. Yet, Lord, we pray, Father, that uh, through what your words say to us today, you will draw us closer to you and we will understand your claims on our lives, uh, not only intellectually but personally, Father. Amen. Okay, now last Monday... Last Monday I sent out a, a notice sheet or a newsletter, a bulletin. And thank you for those who responded with uh, words of encouragement. I hope they did encourage you as much as uh, some, of the, some people uh, uh, gave me encouragement. And I started to look at, at uh, in, during, uh, in that notice sheet, 
I started to look at some of the things that Gethsemane holds for us. Because Gethsemane was never meant just for Jesus, if I understand the nature of the New Testament and what Gethsemane, uh, how, it, how it is described. So, always something happens, isn't there? Is it turned on? <laughs> I've got to learn to do that, haven't I? Thanks, Stuart. Uh, why speak on Gethsemane when it's Palm Sunday? It's become my practice over the last, I don't know, X number of years to speak on Gethsemane on Palm Sunday because in the Anglican cycle of a church, we don't normally get the opportunity to speak on Gethsemane the hours before Jesus died because... With the, with the exception of this church, actually, who's, and we've got uh, Shashis running a Tenebrae service, which is a service of quietness, quietness and darkness on Thursday evening. You might like to attend that. It seems to me to be uh, something that's uh, spiritually strong and uh, reasonably unique. I haven't been through one of these services before, but it sounds like it's got some meat to it. So you might like to come on Thursday night. But it's unusual... In Anglican circles, they're the only ones I mix in really, or let's say Protestant circles, to have a service on Thursday evening. Now, so therefore we miss, guess, we miss Gethsemane. Now, I think there's a great loss to the Christian soul to miss the, the, the story of Gethsemane and Jesus weaving tears of blood in a garden. So why speak on Gethsemane when it's Palm Sunday because Gethsemane so often gets lost in the whole ecclesiastical equation. So that's why I was speaking at Gethsemane now and it was in last Monday's newsletter and it might be again in tomorrow's newsletter. So what I want to do uh, is get Easter correct for us. There is no Golgotha if there is not first the Gethsemane. Now, I wonder if you've ever wondered that or mulled, or mulled upon that fact that Jesus was not going to get to Calvary if he did not first kneel in Gethsemane and get past, Lord, take this cup away from me. If he wasn't willing to go through the pain of Gethsemane, he was not going to enter the torture and the, the reconciliation that Calvary Golgotha is for us. So there's a ser series of events, a sequence that is all sourced in Gethsemane and it had to be sourced in Gethsemane because if it wasn't started there, Golgotha was never going to happen. Now there's a Golgotha for him that made, us, made it possible for us to sit here today and hear his words and consider his impact on our lives. But it started in Gethsemane. But the more I reflect on Gethsemane, Gethsemane was never just for Jesus to pass through. I wonder if you've ever thought of it in that context, in that light. That Gethsemane too is for me. And that's what I want to bring out today. Not just the narrative of Gethsemane, but the fact that it's for each of us to pass through that will claim Jesus as their king and ruler and Lord and Saviour of our life. Now, A.W. Tozer, an outstanding Christian soldier, wrote, Is Christianity just a decoration or is there reality back of it or to the back of it? Now, A.W. Tozer was a minister in the Christian Missionary and Alliance Church in, uh, in the US, which started actually in Canada. He was born about 1897, I think, 1896, somewhere around there, and he died in 1963. Can you put your hand up, please, if you've heard of A.W. Tozer? Now, it seems to me that we all need spiritual heroes in our lives. Uh, 
people that we can also model our life upon or can encourage us or speak into our souls. A.W. Tozer is one of mine. Now, he was a man that was given a car by his congregation in oh, about 1927. So life would be easier for him and he'd be probably more efficient. And he wouldn't take it. Now, I thought that sounds kind of ungracious. And uh, I, I'm too carnal, I would have took it. Even if it was a Ford, I would have took it. <laughs> I don't know what it was. But he didn't take it. And the reason he gave his congregation, now he had a large congregation, he had a congregation of over 500 people. Uh, and this is in the 19, well, the early 1900s. Um, what he told his congregation was he wanted to catch the bus and the tram to work each day because he had more time with the Lord reading in the bus and the tram. Now, you can't argue with that. So he asked, is Christianity just a decoration or is there a reality at the back of it? That's what Gethsemane is asking. That's what Gethsemane is showing through Jesus. There's a lot more to going to the cross than we would ever consider. And in Gethsemane, Jesus is showing us what's at the back of the cross. The depth and the substance and the nature of Christianity that it's not about easy believism. It's not about listening to 2CH. Well, it used to be 2SM, wasn't it? To St Mary. That's where 2SM came from. 2CH is 2 church. Christianity is not for the weak need or the easy believer. And that's shown in Gethsemane. Because there is pain in following. Now, I'm really sorry, guys. When I did this, um, when I prepared this PowerPoint during the week, I wanted to use a new design because there's only two or three I've used so far. And I'll, I chose this design thinking it's fresh, but look, you can't read it, can you? It's too small. And that was the lucky dip I took and it's failed. Now, this passage I'm, uh, I'm going to read to you is in John 12, 23 to 26. It's up there. But if you've got your phones or your Bibles with you, you might like to open it up. This is a little taught passage to my mind. There are lots of passages in John we know. We know about the, 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 uh, the seven I am's and the seven miracles. We've done the prologue in John. We know about the, 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 uh, the changing of the water into wine, the casting out of the temple, the, the money lenders. But this one's probably, arguably, one of the most important passages. And it's neglected. It's not commonly taught. So if you'd like to look at John 12, and these are Jesus' words, just before he goes to Gethsemane. So he knows he's in for a very, very difficult time. Jesus answered. He says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He knew he was going to die. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. It's death that bears the fruit. The seed's got to die before it can reproduce. Now, I know nothing about agriculture. Anybody here know something about agriculture? Oh, that's really good. I can't say anything that people can contradict me on, then, can I? But I'm not going to say anything except to say, I know that seeds have got to die before they can bear much fruit. So Jesus then goes on and he says, whoever loves his life will lose it and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Jesus is speaking now and he's not holding back. He's saying you've got to die to yourself if you're going to reproduce fruit. If you're going to leave a legacy, if you're going to leave something that will gain eternal life, it's about death to self, not indulgence to self. Whoever loves his life will lose it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honour him. 
if I'm going to follow Jesus, if I'm going to do a Gethsemane or prepare for a Gethsemane, I'm going to be willing to lose when everybody else is winning. Now, where's Stevie Bear? He came in and he, so I met him in the foyer this morning. Normally I have that privilege. You probably got the water, did you, Steve? Thanks very much, mate. We know Stevie Bear, don't we? He's a happy chappy today. Parramatta haven't lost yet. <laughs> of course, the way this world works, the world works about winning. Now, I'm not a happy chappy because the Tigers haven't won yet. <laughs> and it's not looking very promising. I have to be humble and admit that fact, that distressing fact. But can you see what Jesus is saying? We are all about winning in this world. But Jesus is saying, no, he's going to reverse the world's thinking. He's going to reverse the order of planning in this world. You've got to get we're ready to lose. Lose in this life and win in the next life. Win in this life and lose in the next life. Doesn't say well for Parramatta, does it, mate? I remember years ago uh, being a, a tragic Tiger so supporter. Uh, Marina Go, the head of the, um, the board for the Tigers, said when they fired another coach, <laughs> another coach, uh, when they fired him, they said, look, we're, we're about winning. The Tigers are about winning, not about losing. So this coach is gone. Now, in the irony of her, of her great judgments, all they've done is continue to lose. Uh, in the multiplication of loss. So she didn't bring betterment by aiming for winning, but she brought detriment. But despite the fact that probably nobody's ever realised that in the footy side of things, because I've never heard her comment, commented on, despite that fact, she said she's all about winning. And the Tigers are all about winning. And of course, that's what we are. We want to win for ourselves in life. Now, Jesus is reversing that. He's saying you die to yourself and you win later. It's about losing now and winning later, not winning now and ignoring later, which of course becomes losing in the, Ecclesiast in the, in the, kingdom, of, um, in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus reverses human thinking. Now, I like the way this finishes, this little passage. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there will, be my, there will my servant be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honour him. The service that is rendered to the good Lord is not missed. Somehow I imagine at times... That there's a chair, one of the a swing that's up in the heavenlies. And the good Lord sitting on that swing and the earth rotating underneath him and he's just enjoying this swing. And he's looking down upon earth and he's scanning earth. It tells me in 2 Chronicles 16 this. He's scanning earth to see those who are honouring him, who are honouring him. Now I know that's not how it works, but it's just a little picture I get in my mind. So the loss is not unnoticed and it will be rewarded. But that's the nature of following Jesus. Tozer knelt at his ordination. He was 23 years of age. And once again, the font's too small and I'm sorry. Tozer knelt in his own Gethsemane. He lived his own John 21. And what that says here, it, what I've done is I've, um, you can get this online, Tozer's Ordination Prayer. I've uh, shortened it so it fits on the one slide. Lord Jesus, this is a 23 year old. Lord Jesus, I come to you for spiritual preparation. I know not what you have for me, nor any ability to do it. He's coming in humility. Teach me self discipline. And save me from the bondage to things. And we've all got that. I can't claim um, innocence at any point there. And please don't check that fact with Beth. 
He goes on and he says, Let me never become a slave to crowds and heal my soul of carnal ambition. O Lord, I consecrate my remaining days to you. He had another 40 years or 40, yeah, 50 years after this. O Lord, I consecrate my remaining days to you. I am your servant to do your will for all I desire to receive is from you. Well done, good and faithful servant. His heart was already in heaven. In, 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 in heaven. And his head was reaffirming it here. He was in his own Gethsemane in his prayer, denying himself. What the Gethsemane does to us and what Toza was doing there, he refused to be conformed to the ways of this world. He was not being conformed to the ways of this world but he's been transformed by the ways of heaven. Now doesn't Paul teach us not to be conformed to the thinking of this world? Tozer prayed it at 23. I reckon that's a good start to life and I wish I had been smart enough to do that. Oh Lord, I wish I had been smart enough to do that. He refused to be conformed to the world. Now he's a spiritual hero of mine find a spiritual hero that did something similar and use them to inspire you as well as God's word and as well as Jesus. But sometimes it's just nice to have somebody you can almost reach out and touch because he's within living memory. So, continuing on. We need to get Jesus correct. This is Tosa's quote, isn't it, about anything, is there anything behind Christianity or is it just hollow? Did Jesus kid us? Is it a, just a messianic embellishment? When Jesus says, he who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. And they're hard words. He who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Is Jesus just an exaggerator with little or no substance to his words? Is Jesus just really kidding? Is that all he's doing? If you're in Gethsemane and you're weeping tears of blood or perspiring blood, if you're in Gethsemane, you are living what Jesus was teaching. He who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus wasn't kidding. He lived this. And then he went further after Gethsemane, didn't he? And surely all Christians at some place are going to decide, are they going to take themselves to the cross? Or are we going to keep puddling around in their own uh, evangelical niceties? Surely the time for Gethsemane comes. Now, and I give you the tip, guys. It's going to hurt. There is no Christianity, Jesus is telling me, at a minimum cost. We all want the benefits of the cross without the burdens of the cross. We all want the salvation of the cross without the suffering of the cross. We all salute the self-denial deniers and wish them well, even promising to pray and dig deep for them. But we don't even briefly consider repeating their example. And I use that in the context of missionaries. We salute those that will, will deny themselves and do dig deep and go, go to the hard places of the earth. But would we ever deliberately consider repeating their example? The people that are going to the to the Africa and the India and the Mongolias. People that are going to South America. What was the name of the fellow who died at 26 in South America? And he said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep 
to gain that which he cannot leave, lose. Jim Elliott, thank you. 26 years of age, he died. Yorker Indians. I was at a conference 20 years ago, 21 years ago in Amsterdam. And Jim Elliott's wife was there at this conference. And Jim Elliott went to, um, to, the, to a group of people called the Orca Indians in South America, A-U-C-A. Now, standing next to Jim Elliott's wife, Elizabeth, was the Indian that put the spear through her husband. They were Christians. And that Indian spoke through a translator, a tiny little man. Up to there, Elizabeth was bigger than him. Now that brings tears to your eyes. So in 1956, Jim Elliott died. In 2001, Jeff Taylor and 10,000 other people see the impact that man had. Of course, he went through his own Gethsemane and he saw Golgotha. It's going to hurt. We all want the benefits of the cross without the burdens of the cross. We all want the salvation of the cross without the suffering of the cross. We all salute the self-deniers and we wish them well, even promising to pray and dig deep for them. But I do not even briefly consider repeating their example. So what does Gethsemane look like? How do I know when I'm in Gethsemane? Gethsemane is the wrestle of submission. Gethsemane is the promise of uncommon pain. Gethsemane is betrayal of your friends who sell you out in sleep or in cash. I wonder if you ever thought about that. Did Jesus feel that he was betrayed by his, by his inner call? Too busy sleeping instead of being ready for him? Too busy indulging their own um, weariness instead of looking to him in their tiredness as well? I wonder. The Bible doesn't say so, but it certainly indicates it. What does Gethsemane look like? It is the demand to subdue the flesh and not to return fire. Which is what Jesus did as they, they were, um, he was come to be arrested. He did not return fire, did he? And I think Gethsemane is the place where its cost is counted. It's not denied. Gethsemane counts the cost and doesn't back away, Gethsemane counts the cost and still goes forward to Golgotha. It does not deny the cost. So, a recap. There is no Golgotha if there is not first to Gethsemane. Gethsemane was never just for Jesus to pass through. He who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. He's already set the model for us. So the Gethsemane guarantee. Those who leave the lasting legacies are those who have given up the most, who have carried the greatest loss. Because life, when you're following the good Lord, in his model and what he has set for us, is all about losing, it's not about winning. Life is about losing. I get life correct when I'm willing to lose. Those who have the greatest impacts are those who have sought influence above affluence. It is these who have learned that what Jesus lived and he showed in Gethsemane and we'll celebrate next Sunday. It is these who have learned what Jesus lived. Life was never about me anyway. Life was never about me anyway. Let's pray. Almighty Lord, uh, 
we want to come before you as humble as we can. That you will touch our hearts and our hearts are open to you. Our hearts are available to you for when we face Gethsemane we won't flee but we'll go to Golgotha. Amen. Going to stand and sing our next song, Consider Christ. song contained a prayer. My Lord and God, you are so rich in mercy. Mere words alone are not sufficient thanks. So take my life, transform, renew and change me, that I might be a living sacrifice. That we might indeed encounter our Gethsemane, carry our cross daily and follow him. We're going to continue in a time of prayer now and we're going to do that firstly by saying the church prayer together. Together. Heavenly Father, thank you that we are your dearly loved children, saved from your judgment 
by the death of Jesus, your Son, and born again by your Spirit. As we live as disciples of Jesus, please enable us to make and grow more disciples from all generations and nations, all for your praise alone. Thank you for your living word. May we always prayerfully receive it and spread it to one another and to the world, for that is the way you work in this world. Please enable us to walk each day by your spirit, growing in faith, hope and love. We ask all this in the great name of our only Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Uh, we're going to um, pray for our Operation World Country this week, which is Canada, second largest country in the world in terms of land mass. Oops, what happened to it? Maybe I have to go to the PowerPoint at the bottom. Oh, I might. So I'll try using this. Sorry, I can't. We've been having troubles with it going to PowerPoint outside of Easy Worship. So I think that's what happened. <laughs> anyway, um, it says that uh, Canada has a very large Christian population. Uh, they've got a population of 33, well, nearly 34 million. And uh, Christians make up 24 million. But evangelicals make up 2 million. So that's Bible-believing Christians. So many Canadians consider themselves Christian from their heritage, but uh, don't really have a personal faith in Jesus. They've got a country renowned for being open-hearted and uh, sending aid and peacekeepers and missionaries into the world. But over the past uh, 25 or so years, that's the third one of those has ceased. They no longer send missionaries out. Um, in fact, we sent missionaries there to create, uh, to be involved in um, church planting and telling people about Jesus that's in the Bible. So let's pray for Canada now. Heavenly Father, we pray for the nation of Canada. And we thank you for the strong nation they've been in past years in uh, sending your gospel out, as well as in supplying aid and help to other countries around the world. We pray that you would empower members of the church to uh, hear the call to spread the gospel in their own country, in their own provinces, and also to the world. We pray that they be able to reach the unevangelized who have immigrated into their country. And we pray that you'd give Canadian Christians a passion to reach those people. We pray also for the Christian media in Canada that uh, they can remain biblical and that they would have a passion for spreading the gospel using their um, media as influence. And we pray for the 300 colleges and universities that would raise up Christians in those places to be ambassadors for Christ and to train and encourage Christians who will serve in their local communities. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Very excited. <laughs> that was uh, Ezra. He has a new sister. Don't know if you heard, but uh, early Wednesday morning at uh, nine past one, Tally delivered a baby girl, uh, Joanna Kate. That's Joanna with an H. It means God is gracious. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, he's going to pray for other issues now. For those in authority, 
Almighty God, ruler of the nations of the world, give wisdom to the Prime Minister of Australia, Scott Morrison, and to the Premier of this state, Gladys Berejiklian, to the Members of Parliament, and to all who hold public office in this land. Grant that their decisions may be based on wise counsel so that peace and welfare, truth and justice may prevail among us and make us a blessing to other nations through Jesus Christ our Lord. For others who work in government. Gracious Lord, grant to our governments and all who serve in public life wisdom and skill, imagination and energy. Protect them from corruption and the temptation to serve themselves. Help us all to commit ourselves to the common good, that our land may be a secure home for all its peoples. Through Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Amen. For the sick. Almighty God, giver of life and health, hear our prayers for those in our midst who are not well. For Sharon, for Jeanette, for Marion, for Wendy, for Yolandi, and others that we know. We pray also for those who minister to them. May they be restored to health of body and mind according to your will. And in the presence of your people, give thanks to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord God, look on with mercy on all for whom increasing years bring isolation and distress. Give them understanding helpers and the willingness to receive what is offered. As their strength diminishes, increase their faith and their assurance of your love. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And for families. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, whose Son Jesus Christ shared at Nazareth the life of an earthly home. Bless our homes, we pray. Help parents to impart the knowledge of you and your love, and children to respond with love and obedience. May our homes be blessed with peace and joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And to finish, we have some responsive prayer. If you say the words in yellow. Be exalted, Lord, above the heavens. Let your glory cover the earth. Keep our nation under your care and guide us in justice and truth. Let your way be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Send out your light and truth, that we may tell of your saving works. Hear our prayers, O Lord, for we put our trust in you. Amen. Steve, you've got some announcements. Morning, everyone. Uh, Easter is always a fairly full time of the year when it comes to church, and this morning's announcements reflect that. So, if something I say you're interested in but it gets lost amongst all the announcements, feel free to come and ask me afterwards about it again. Uh, so, a few things. Sue has just asked me to mention there's, she's still waiting on about six BCA Bush Church aid boxes. So, if you have a Bush Church aid box, if you can try and get that to Sue as soon as possible, that would be <laughs> um, appreciated. Uh, also, just a reminder that uh, our annual general meeting is on at 11.30 after the service uh, today, and we'll have a BYO lunch afterwards. So please really consider sticking around for the annual general meeting. I know it's one of those things that can be easier to think, I'll just skip out on that. But God has given us all in our own area uh, responsibility for the good and healthy functioning of his church. And taking part and being present for the annual general meeting is one of the ways in which we can carry that out. So that's 11.30 after <laughs> this morning's service. 
Uh, just a reminder, prayer meeting tomorrow night, uh, but it'll be the last one for, we'll take a break over the school holidays and start again when um, school starts back on the 19th of April. So please uh, join in on Zoom for our prayer meeting tomorrow evening at 7.30. Uh, a couple of men's events coming up. Uh, Jesus for the Skeptics, which is the 22nd of April, Jeff, is that right? Or May? May, 22nd of May. Okay, so that's a little bit in the future, but just keep that in the back of your mind, man. Uh, that's, that'll be at Oran Park Anglican. And uh, we'll have a men's breakfast here on the 17th of April at 7 o'clock. The cost will be $5.00. And on Thursday night, as Jeff mentioned earlier, we'll have a Tenebrae service, uh, which is a series of readings um, uh, leading up to the crucifixion. Uh, so that'll be 8 o'clock on Thursday. Uh, now, next Sunday as well, after church, because, you know, Resurrection Sunday, it should be a big deal for us. We're celebrating the resurrection of our Lord Jesus I thought uh, for those that maybe don't have um, other family things on or, or who just want to hang out with your church family a little bit more, we're going to have a picnic after church, uh, BYO <laughs> everything. I was thinking we'll have it at the park at Eagle Farm, just sort of behind the library there. There's a playground for the kids and plenty of open space for anyone who wants to have a game of cricket or something. However, if the grass is mowed there, it's pretty long at the moment. If the grass is not mowed, we'll have it somewhere else and I'll tell you next Sunday. So that we'll um, probably start meeting at about 12 o'clock at the park next Sunday. Um, and I think that, oh, Steve had something quickly he wanted to say as well. Thank you. <laughs> so um, just two announcements. So I spoke to Craig Cooper last Sunday night um, and he's going well and he wishes um, you well and um, he actually uh, also uh, called it to say if um, any, of, any of you would like to go to the Tigers and the Parramatta game next Monday night um, at Bankwest Stadium. So because his congregation, half of his congregation go for Parramatta. So, <laughs> so um, his congregation and himself is going to go uh, to Bankwest, we're going to meet up. If you would like to go... Can you let, us, let me know by at least Wednesday? It costs $25 to, um, to get in, and it's $10 for kids and $10 for, uh, for concessions. If you've got any transport issues, come and see me. But um, it's next Monday at uh, 4 p.m. Thanks. <coughs> Just two other quick things. Don't forget to <laughs> update your details for the church directory and the foyer. Um, so if your, direct, if your details in there and they're correct and you're happy for them to stay in there, just put a tick next to it. If you want your details taken out, put a line through it. If you want your details changed, if your numbers changed since the last directory, just update those details so Jenny can do that later. And just a reminder, also Good Friday service is 9 o'clock, not 9.45, okay? 9 o'clock for Good Friday. Thanks. So we're going to stand and, and uh, sing our final song, which is My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness. Peace.
we're singing your blessing. Blessing of the Lord, know His peace and love as you serve your King. Go now with the blessing of the Lord, share His love and make new friends for Him. Please join in. Go. with each other. You can mingle now.